While Chris Hansen has the most ingenious trap set for these filthy people, some of them managed to get around even that. Yeah, meet the infamous David Kay, the rabbi who decided to give the decoy a little a sneak peek before he actually showed up. What's more, it wasn't just him. It was him with a bunch of others, busy doing, well, I'm sure you can guess. Despite knowing the consequences and even mentioning it in the chats, the man put his plans into motion anyway. With a head full of misplaced confidence, this 54-year-old walked into the kitchen like he owned the place. Now, David continued to have a conversation with his decoy date with a set of doors between them, and Chris took the opportunity to sneak up on the guy. And the dude was left speechless, but what happened next was the real shocker. A rabbi. A rabbi. When the man revealed his occupation, it had to have been the shock of the century, because if a rabbi would stoop this low, what was stopping literally anyone else? But David had a close-up on his schedule, and when they gave it to him, he lost it. Computer patterns. Oh, no. Yeah, this episode was an eye-opener in more ways than one. For one, the crew were shocked to find a so-called holy man in the center of their sting. And secondly, they knew how dangerous he was. Don't, don't, you don't want, you don't want to touch anybody. You don't want it. Yeah, the dude came charging towards Chris, and had it not been for the cameraman, who knows how things would have ended. But they kept on keeping on in spite of him. After all, if you want to pull up weeds, you gotta take out the roots, too. Though it wasn't just the actual creeps that needed to be kept in the dark. It was critical that the entire neighborhood was oblivious to what happened behind those closed doors. Loose lips sink ships, after all. And while they had some serious backup from the cops, there was another player on their side, too. And that was the Watchdog Organization. These guys were no joke when they came onto the scene in 2002, right when cybercrimes first started to become, well, a thing that was possible to do. Operating primarily out of California and Oregon, perverted justice wanted to take the fight to the actual creeps themselves, just like this one right here. Yeah, this dude blew things way out of proportion. So this dude decided to walk in like Kennelly, if you know what I mean. And as soon as he sensed that the decoy was interested in him, he dropped some nasty pictures of himself just like the rabbi did. Right. The decoy says, come on in, I'm just going to do something real quick and I'll come out. And she comes into the room where I'm at. Boy, this dude was worse. He wanted to go through the act in every room and even proposed a plan to rope her other friends in too. And if that wasn't enough, the dude wanted to loop in her pet cat while he was at it as well. And I wish I was kidding about that. You want to explain yourself? Grab that towel right there, please. But once he was busted, when Chris asked him what would have happened if the decoy had been in the house, Marvin admitted that he would have certainly gone through with his plan. But even while admitting his intent, he tried to play it off as garden variety joking around. Of course he was caught and handed over to the cops. If he wasn't, someone would have given them hell to pay. But we don't live in that twisted a reality. But certainly one twisted enough to try and pin luring on the crew. And even still, they kept going. With one person after another making their way to the courtroom and serious work being done to curtail the threat these guys were on the internet, the show managed to run on NBC for about four years before abruptly hitting a roadblock. NBC made the decision not to do new productions. And the cultural impact of it all, it was real as hell. You see, the show's reach extended way beyond its own space and has been referenced across all sorts of media. Take this for example. Hansen from To Catch a Credit Horn. Yeah, tell me this show isn't a cultural icon. And Chris welcomed these parodies with open arms. He was proud that the show had such notoriety that it was making cultural waves. I mean, talk about free advertising, right? And beyond that, in one of his interviews, he talked about how his appearance on South Park managed to get a reaction out of his children, who weren't normally interested in his work. When Chris Hansen was parodied on South Park, that was a big deal. Suddenly I was cool. And with the show getting so popular, it's no wonder that its face was getting popular too. Seem to stop crying. <laughs> but popularity wasn't the point here. It certainly helped, but they had both different means and different ends. 
Nazis. Yeah, all they wanted to do was make an example out of these people in order to stop others from doing the same. You've caught 200 and 50 possible uh, potential child predators. That's exactly which is a, right. First of all, fantastic service. But like I led with at the top of this video, it all came crashing every day with the decoy, sometimes multiple times in a single day. And with the highest profile person they'd ever had in their crosshairs on the line, the prosecutor wanted to hedge their bets. Yes. It looks huge. When the decoy asked Conrad to meet up, the dude started to sense something was amiss and bailed. But what followed next was totally unpredictable. At first, Conrad went off the radar and deleted that in excess account of his. But the police had already gone through the trouble of nabbing a warrant for his arrest. He gets an arrest warrant. He also decides to involve the police in Terrell. The show's executive took him over the edge, but that was never part of the plan. The crew and the cops were just as taken aback as the locals. It was Conrad's call to make at the end of the day, but his sister Patricia Conrad had more than just words for Dateline. But I intend to fight as hard and as long as I can to prevent other people from becoming victims of such reckless actions as those taken by your employees. And the rest is history, I guess. But let me bring up this statement made by the chief of police himself. Conrad had committed a felony the moment he started the conversation with the decoy. He didn't have to really show up at a sting house or even somewhere public for the police to have him dead to rights. And being a DA, Conrad, the aftermath had a ton of surprises on its own. The Murphy PD seized three encrypted computers from Conrad's house, which would later serve as key evidence in the wrongful death case that Patricia filed. The network tried its best to get information from the police, since all of it was locked away on encrypted devices. Dateline later aired an episode which claimed that a ton of explicit images had allegedly been found on Conrad's laptop, the same one he used to contact the decoy. When Dateline was finally dragged into the courtroom itself, 23 other cases cases came to light, and that was the beginning of the end. Dateline had failed to provide the court with any of the chat logs or videos associated with the event. Even the DA argued that the Murphy Police Department, who were on the scene, were merely acting as agents for the show itself since they had no real legal permission to conduct a sting. Reasons. Um, I was attached to it. Oh, well, it's not hard to understand why. He thought he could outsmart the cameras and escape justice, but his web of lies quickly unraveled. So, 27-year-old Justin Smith worked as a post-production editor at Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon of all places. But outside his workplace, Justin was anything but kid-friendly. Or maybe a bit too kid-friendly? Anyway, if there's one word that describes the conversation he had with the setup, who was ironically named Carly, no, I am not kidding, it'd be disturbing. bad, I think you're this cute, laugh out loud. The girl asks, how come? He writes back, cause I'm 27. The guy was fully aware that he was talking to someone half his age, and yet, he just kept going like it was no big deal. But that wasn't even the half of it. Well, naked pictures of himself. But the next day, Smith seems to express regrets. You see, this guy didn't just stop at flirting. He took things a step further by sending some pics, exposing himself to her. It already boggles the mind that anyone would do something like that. But what made it even worse was him trying to fake regret. He told the setup how it was illegal, but apparently it didn't cross his mind before hitting the send button. And after expressing his concern, guess what he did next? Over the course of 10 days, Smith sends her links to 40 videos showing everything from to among multiple partners. Dude was bold, that's for sure. But he still went wild sharing those videos. And when I say wild, I'm talking some next level group action kind of stuff. Showing everything from to among multiple partners. For someone who was so worried about breaking the law, he had an interesting way of showing it. And those worries weren't enough to keep him away from the sting house. No, those fantasies of his won out. And he ended up meeting with the setup. I made us some drinks. Awesome. And we have a hot dog. Awesome. I'm sure he was thinking about how he was gonna score big time, but he was in for a big surprise instead. To talk about 
you and I. Why don't you just have a seat right there, please? Yep, he definitely wasn't expecting that. Now, here's the thing. Not only was this man as disturbing as they come, but he was also a coward. Don't believe me? Well, I'll let him do the talking. No, I need you. No. Seriously. You're going to want to talk to me. I'm sorry. Trust me on this. Now, you work at Nickelodeon, huh? Or, well, the running. He really thought he could escape just like that. But I guess he hadn't watched the show before. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Get on your knees! Your hand back your head! Back your head! So All right, you're on your knees! Smith started bawling his eyes out, apologizing over and over, swearing he didn't mean to screw up like this. And during the interview, he freaked out about how this could mess up his job and even ruin the relationship he had with his family. He was also really torn up about his puppy, too. Still, he's not getting any sympathy from me. Anyway, just like he predicted, when news of his, uh, extracurricular activities surfaced, Nickelodeon axed him, and also issued a statement that claimed he had never worked with kids on the job. Thank goodness for that. Well, now that we're done getting slimed, let's see what this next guy has in store for us. Or should I say... guys? Okay, so this guy, Polkit Mater, who was an HR rep at an IT company, was practically the dictionary definition of gross. Now, this guy started off his chat with the setup in pretty spectacular fashion. After he plans a date for s with her, he asks Kira if she has a friend for his colleague Kanish. The decoy said yes. That's right, he actually asked the setup if she could also hook his friend up with somebody her age too. So not only was he digging his own grave, but also his friends. Outstanding move, dude. You've got the makings of a watchdog yet. And I'd bet a million bucks that his friend had intentions that were just as bad, if not worse. So the day of the meetup eventually rolled around. And these two guys showed up at the sting house, looking really pleased with themselves. Finally. So come on back. I made some frozen lemonade for us. Oh yeah, these guys were really excited. And as soon as the setup mentioned that she'd get changed real quick and hit the hot tub, you could tell it really got them going. And their nasty imaginations too. If you guys want to get in the hot tub, feel free. I'll turn it on, okay? You can jump in. Too bad their dreams came crashing down as soon as Chris popped out from around the corner, practically the second after the setup left. Hey guys. Hello. Why don't you have a seat right over there, please? And since he had two guys to deal with, Chris wasted no time in getting straight to business. Twice the weirdo, twice the effort, right? The first question Chris asked them was what they were doing at the place. And like most people caught in the sting, their first move wasn't exactly honest. Just have to have food. Just food. Friend, yes. Just food, huh? Well, if I remember correctly, there was a lot more than food being talked about online, but I get it. These guys had no idea that Chris had the entire chat log history. And once he pulled it out, trust me, neither of them were ready for it. You still want me to spend the night with you? No, no, I don't. Yes, you say. I will kiss you from bottom. I will treat you nicely. How do you like to be loved? The cat was out of the bag, and Polkit here thought he could just deny everything and walk out of the situation scot-free. But you have to listen to his excuse. Just trust me. No, oh, that is just a chat. That's it. No, I don't. Just a chat. I don't feel like it. Well, it sounds like you felt like you wanted to be with her from this chat. Yeah, he had the audacity to claim the entire thing was just online talk and nothing more. He even added saying that it wasn't intentional. Oh, right, for sure. I definitely have those sort of typos too. Super relatable problem. What's more, apparently they were on a business trip from India. And this is how they wanted to spend their time stateside. <sighs> the world we live in. Anyway, the more Chris tried to corner them, the more the excuses kept rolling. While it was Polkit doing most of the talking, his friend Kanish decided to give him a hand every now and then. So why were you here to see a girl? I came sorry here for that. Sorry for that. He, he said that, you know, you come, I don't know the way. So after Chris started getting sick about the dishonesty, he finally broke the news to them, and they were arrested right after. But guess what? They weren't the only dynamic duo to show up at the Sting House in such a spectacularly disgusting fashion. 
If you ask me, I think Asfor's up there with some of the weirdest guys caught on the show. But he wasn't the only one who rolled up to the sting house that day. Why don't you come in over here and uh, stand right over here at the bar? How are you? Oh, good, how are you? good, good. Please come here. I want you guys to meet each other. As soon as Asfor walked in, he wasn't just met with Chris, but also Sarfraz Khan. Now, this dude wasn't his friend or anything like that, but just some dude who shared common interests with him. But wait, Gazan, or shall I say, slave to mistresses, had crazier ideas than even Khan, if you can believe it. Like Khan, as four, mostly wanted the girl to do things to him. In other words, let's just say that he had some pretty nasty fantasies bouncing around in his head. Prefers to be treated like a dog, and also a toilet. We'll have oh man. Trust me, this can top the list of the most disgusting morons on the show. Like, let me spell it out for you. He wanted to be treated like a dog. And even worse, a toilet. I'm not gonna even bother explaining to you how twisted that is. Should be self-explanatory. And again, this is TCAP we're talking about here, so you know the kind of person he was interested in getting it on with. But this dude apparently had an infinite amount of surprises in store, because what he did next somehow raised the stakes even further. He sends live video of himself naked and wearing a dog collar, along with a link to a website that illustrates what he's talking about. Calling it disgusting doesn't even cut it. Not only did he talk about all the nasty things he was into, but also sent some really nasty videos of himself putting those ideas into practice. Man, this happened like a decade ago, and I still feel gross going over it. Anyway, when Chris tried to dig deeper into what they were thinking, the dude not only decided to lie, but also claimed that he wasn't aware of the setup's age. Now, playing innocent wasn't the smartest move he had up his sleeve, but he decided to do it anyway. Meanwhile, Khan had some concerns of his own, and he wanted to get them off his chest. Is my family gonna have to know about this? Why are you so concerned about your family? Because this, this is something that would just... You know? You should have thought about that before coming over to the house, buddy. And as for as for, he had some clarifications of his own to make. What is all, what is all this about? I don't talk to have sex. Yeah, I think those chat logs Chris was literally waving in front of their faces would beg to differ. And when confronted about the inappropriate pictures they both sent, well, Sarfraz owned up to it, as for decided to play dumb, saying he didn't remember any of it. Well, I guess out of the two, Khan seemed like the smarter one, because when Chris revealed what was going on, he knew his fate was sealed. He'd heard of the show. As for as for, he was completely clueless. Still appears confused, but Khan clearly knows what's coming. Yeah, we're, not, we're both gonna get arrested. Well, either way, both the guys prepared themselves for the consequences they were about to face. The cops slapping the cuffs on their wrists would do that. Now, the last two guys I've talked about have had the benefit of teamwork. Are there any solo acts gross enough to challenge them? Well, give it up for 54-year-old Stanley Kendall. If he can't do it, no one can. So his advanced age, in comparison to most other guys on the show, already made things that much grosser. The setup was old enough to be his grandkid, after all. Now, you'd expect someone of his age to take things a little slower, right? Well, what he had to say in his chats begged to differ. It's the kind of thing that's so depraved that you would have to see it to believe it. Play, if possible. The decoy asks, like what? Stanimac describes in graphic and very specific detail what he wants to do with the voice sexually. The decoy acts a bit shocked. See what I mean? But that wasn't the end of it. What he said next really ratcheted up the gross factor. I like younger guys to play with. Do you want to play or try? Oh, okay. Not only did he admit to having a preference for younger people, but also later in the chats when the setup revealed his age, this jerk made good on that preference. Because as long as he didn't call the police or anything, Stanley was totally fine with going all the way. 
that level of self-awareness as to how wrong this was, not to mention all the stuff he was risking taking this chance, and yet deciding to go along with it, really disturbs me. He wasn't just some idiot who didn't have the foresight to understand the consequences. He was completely lucid. Guess this dude's desires outweighed his morals. But wait, there's still more. What Stanley did next really sealed the deal for me to put him on this list. A little later, the potential predator sends a photo of his genital and asks the decoy, Do you want to play with it? Yep. Out came the graphic pictures. Why am I not surprised? Now, just to tease him a little bit, the crew came up with a plan. When Stanley showed up, the setup decided to pull his leg by asking what they should start with first. That question definitely got his hopes up and really primed him to lay out his desires in no uncertain terms. But of course, someone had to put an end to those hopes. And who better than Chris himself? A lesson planned for tonight. Oops. Sorry for what? What's funny was how not even a second passed after Chris entered the room and Stanley was already apologizing. So Chris obviously had to ask him why. I thought I thought this was a joke. You thought what was a joke? You thought it was a joke. Sure, buddy. Guess his age didn't grant him much in the way of wisdom. What's more, he claimed that it was his first time doing something like this. But honestly, it's hard to believe given how casually he laid his desires out in front of the setup in the chat room. But now, it was time for the big revelation. I teach math. And what grade do you teach? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Sixth, seventh. Disturbing doesn't even begin to describe it. The fact that he was anywhere near children after the stunt he pulled at the house really makes my skin crawl. Like, imagine what he was thinking around them. He claimed he never looked at them the wrong way because he had taught in school for 24 years, and apparently that was proof enough. And to add to the gross factor, this dude had four kids of his own. What? What the f He then tried to sell his sob story that, for personal reasons, he wasn't allowed to see his kids. Yeah, not hard to see why. But this man wasn't done yet. As a final gambit, he fell back on religion. I was thinking the part of me that's Christian was going to talk him out of it. However, Chris wasn't happy with his excuse. With like and said, nipples and licking and you. What, where is that in the Bible? Explain that to there's me. There's a human part is that of the me Old that Testament sins. or the New Testament? All he had to say in return was that he was sorry. But I bet he'd be even sorrier once Chris revealed his identity. Sorry. I have learned my lesson. The color completely drained from his face. Good. But the final guy I've got for you is the perfect capstone for this kind of list. Well, if Vile had a face, it'd be Brian Dorries. Trust me, calling this 24-year-old Vile is no exaggeration. The conversation the guy had with the setup? Sickening barely even begins to describe what went down between them. He wants to have sex with her, and what position he will use. But he didn't just stop there. He even sent some really inappropriate and just downright nasty videos of him touching himself. Can't say the guy wasn't bold, I'll tell you that much. And what he said in the chats only got worse from there. He even revealed something so huge that it sealed his fate right then and there. The decoy responds, Did you teach her the same things you're gonna teach me? He replies, I sure did. And she loved it. We all know he was talking to a setup, but by admitting that he had been with someone else younger than him before, he'd practically dug his own grave. Normally, these guys are a lot more careful, so as to prevent people like Chris from getting hard evidence and proving a history of offenses. But the worst part was the fact that he said it so casually. It almost felt like he was somehow proud of it. And once he reached the house, the setup decided to ask him what he brought for her. And trust me, this dude came prepared for some heavy action. Got my clothes, I brought condoms. As soon as the setup said that she was gonna get dressed, Brian thought it was time to make his move. He immediately got up and tried to dash towards his car to get more stuff. But Chris wasn't about to let that happen. See right over there for me, please. <laughs> confronted him about the setup's age, but instead of telling the truth, he lied by adding another year to it, as if that made any difference at all. The dude did his best to play dumb, but, well, 
nobody was buying it. So you knew that going in? Well, I don't know for sure. He didn't stop there. He was far from finished with his excuses. Applause changed his mind she about coming, up. but admits during his hour-long drive from Orlando, he made a point of stopping for some supply. Apparently, he was hesitating to go along with the plan, but decided to stick to it anyway. Mountain Dew. Later, when Chris confronted him about the chats, he straight up admitted that he wanted an intimate relationship with the setup. Nonetheless, he tried to deflect the blame by saying that he only came because the setup invited him. Man, what a way to end things. Victim blaming the most disgusting excuse of them all. Think that was clever? The next sting operation was sheer brilliance because he managed to catch someone who thought that he could get away with his antics. I'm not telling you lies, sir. It doesn't make sense. I know. Yikes, that was embarrassing. You see, Ernest Timmons pulled a classic move by throwing out a fake name and shaving off a few years to claim he was 30. Okay, that's gonna be Jokater. He's supposed to be in a mid-sized Chevy, he said. The good old one-two punch. Ernest put a lot of effort into faking his persona and even went to the extent of rechristening himself as Kevin. On the surface, Ernest was just fishing for an easy conversation, but what he ended up with was trouble. At first, this dude started with some friendly banter, but in record time, he started diving into the deep end, inquiring about her purity. What do you want me to do? whatever you want. And nope, he didn't stop there. He then started dropping questions about her intimate history. And believe me, it was revolting. I mean, imagine asking someone immature if they had sucked on the thingy. Like, where do I even begin about this? But Ernest was in a rush to cross all lines of decency and enter into personal territory. It was so cringeworthy that even the PJ crew called him out for his moronic behavior. And what was his defense? He didn't want to grab the legal system's attention. Ah, so you knew it, didn't you? You knew exactly what you were getting yourself into. Maybe you're just thinking with my head. No, I want the real thing. But here's the thing. Just because you call something a thingy doesn't mean we don't all know what you're talking about. And that's all that matters to the cops. Despite the risk, Ernest wanted to keep the conversation going. It was too depressing to drop the topic especially with someone who called herself girly girl, of course. But then came the photo request. Do you have a picture of your bees I could see? Like seriously, dude? If you're that scared, why even go there? Ernest almost sounds like someone who has a dual personality. At one point, he was pitching some crazy ideas to the setup. And at the very next, he was asking her if she was a cop who was waiting to cuff him. I'm scared to get caught with a then don't tell anyone. I mean, get a grip, man. Decide what you want and stick to it. Throughout the conversation, he tried to act tough, but the only thing that happened was that he ended up looking like a fool. But wait, it gets worse. I can't imagine how someone who suspected cops to be waiting on the other side could go into describing, and more importantly, demanding some really twisted oil and anal activities. Yeah, you and everybody else on this damn show, buddy. What's more, he kept circling back to his fear, questioning if she was just messing with him more times than I can count. Yeah, he was trying to play the victim while simultaneously being the creepiest guy in the conversation. You could bring one. <laughs> to do what? I don't know. <laughs> to add to the craziness, the setup didn't even have to lure him in. Ernest was more than ready to take things ahead and straight up demanded more info, specifically her address. I'm glad you can make it. But he wanted some extra motivation before he actually hit the road. And a top pick was exactly what the doctor ordered. Oh, believe me when I say this, Ernest was on a mission to make this conversation as uncomfortable as possible and was quite successful at it. But as it turns out, not everything was going in his favor. The setup sadly didn't have a camera. So what did Ernest suggest? That he'd bring one along. Wow, how generous, I guess. Come sit down. I made some brownies. You want some? Oh, no. By the way, he didn't just let the matter slide. He wanted to know how she was. And when she seemed uncertain, he asked her to use the palms of her hands to measure her assets. Dude really just couldn't use his imagination, could he? 
Well, of course the setup called him out for his nonsense. But do you know what was his comeback? He had the audacity to question why she couldn't just pretend to be legal. I mean, if it were that easy, the cops would be having a hell of a time trying to catch guys like him. And to make things even worse, he then started giving her instructions on how to be freshen up before he arrived. He wasn't talking about taking a shower. Apparently, the cleaner and the better the smell, the better his tongue action for her. His words, not mine. I mean, I'm seriously starting to feel queasy here. Anyway, when she asked for a photo, he reassured her, saying it was to hedge his bets. He was getting real scared of law enforcement breathing down his neck. So I knew he was either gonna do something really quick or he was just gonna take off. Clearly a guilty conscience at play. And then, just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, he suggested deleting their chat and made another request for her to receive him, undressed. Well, it seems like this dude had a huge itinerary planned out for the night. But guess what? He could only stick around for like 30 to 60 minutes. Gee, I wonder why. Did this dude have to make another questionable pit stop elsewhere? I guess we'll never know. Because as you know, Casey, the setup, wasn't any ordinary girl. Here comes another suspect who will also try to play this as a big misunderstanding. She welcomed him with a bright smile, but Ernest seemed to be in a pretty big rush. Are you sure? Yeah, can we just go upstairs for a little bit? Oh, let's just hang it here for a little bit. Why don't you sit down? Okay, well, I need to get going here a little down. bit. It'll be fine. Yeah. Brushing off all attempts at conversation or even a simple offer of refreshments, this prick wanted to get straight to business, complete with a camera in hand. And by business, I mean, yeah, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Go ahead and find you to get going down, here a little bit. Be fine. Yeah. The thing is, our man here was all about discipline. No time to waste, you see. He wanted to head upstairs the moment he walked into the door. I mean, he didn't even feel the need to sit and get to know the setup. He only had half an hour or so, he claimed. To me, it sounded more like, well, I think I know you enough, so let's get the deed over and done with. And guess what? He even mentioned in the chats that he wouldn't be hanging around for long. When Casey suggested waiting it out for a bit, Ernest broke into a cold sweat. This is gonna be something of a theme going forward if the title of the video didn't give it away. So I knew he was either gonna do something really quick or he was just gonna take off. His reaction was rather strange. Either he was super stressed out or he decided to indulge in a little something before showing up. And, honestly, at this point, nothing would surprise me. Well, weren't you going to bring me lotion or anything? Oh, no, I don't have any. Oh, because I thought you were going to teach me some stuff, that's all. Ernest was consumed by anxiety at this point. You could practically see the discomfort written all over his face. He either wanted to seal the deal or make a run for it. In fact, he stormed in, rejecting all offers of conversation and refreshments. Because, well, this jerk was a man on a mission. And, well, hospitality wasn't exactly cutting it for him. This prick just wanted to head upstairs and get busy with absolutely no time for small talk. But hey, come on, man. Slow down a little. Smell the roses. Shake hands with the adult man walking over to you. But Chris wasn't going to allow either of it. Is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, actually, everything is just fine, but I need you to have a seat right there for me. Yes, sir. As soon as he made his entrance, Chris, very kindly, asked Ernest to take a seat. He was probably hoping to diffuse the tension a bit. As for Ernest, he was feeling every last bit of the pressure. The setup did turn out to be a cop after all. Just have a seat, please. Have a seat. Ernest was a bundle of nerves. You could practically see the anxiety radiating off of him. But I mean... It's not like he stumbled into this blindfolded. He'd seen the show, he knew the drill, and yet he couldn't keep his fantasies at bay. But you have to give it to him. Throughout the confrontation with Chris, Ernest was consistent. He stuck to his story, no matter how full of BS it was. And believe me, this dude came up with an absolutely insane one. My friend told me to come here to take, uh, bring the camera and... <laughs> Your friend told you to come here. Yes, sir. Ernest claimed his mysterious friend Kevin told him to bring a camera. Okay, at this point, there are too many questions coming to mind. Who was Kevin? 
what does he have to do with the camera? And if Kevin was the one who was in that chat room all along, then why the heck are you here? Sadly, Ernest's explanation was even more twisted than the truth. Kevin, and what's Kevin's last name? I don't know. How long have you known this friend? <laughs> we just met on, on, the, on the base. You could practically see the skepticism written all over Chris's face. And honestly, can you blame the guy? But did Ernest back down? Absolutely not. After dishing a whole lot of lies, he admitted that he didn't even know his own buddy's last name. Ernest was caught in his game red-handed, and yet somehow, he thought pushing the boundaries even further was the way to go. But hey, let's give credit where it is due. I mean, who else could come up with such a far-fetched story on the fly? But let's not forget, the bigger the lie, the harder it is to swallow. At least he knew where things were heading. So you were gonna come in, and you have your camera ready. It was like he was living in his own little fantasy world and reality was starting to crash down around him. By this point, Ernest was sweating bullets, desperately trying to salvage whatever shreds of dignity he had left, but to no avail. I, I that you want to run exactly. up, You want to run upstairs because you only have a little bit of time. Do you see why this does not make sense? It would have been easier for Ernest to just come clean instead of digging himself into a deeper hole with all these lies. I mean, seriously, couldn't he see that Chris wasn't buying what he was selling? But hey, I've got to admit, there's a certain kind of entertainment in watching someone squirm like Ernest was. And let's be real, he was kind of asking for it. Well, you have to agree, karma's a funny thing, isn't it? Yes, sir, I, I, I perfectly, I, why do you think I'm just as stunned as you are? Ha well, you're stunned because you got caught, that's why you're stunned. Meanwhile, Chris wasn't having any of it. He called Ernest out on his BS in the most hilarious way possible, leaving Ernest floundering for excuses. But Ernest? obviously stubborn, kept insisting he wasn't lying, even as the evidence piled up against him. As the Air Force mechanic sweats profusely, he reveals he's about to be deployed to Iraq. Ernest continued to be in denial about the whole situation, and strangely, it was both sad and kind of hilarious to watch. But he wasn't done yet. Just as Chris thought it was about time he handed him over to the cops, Ernest dropped a bombshell. I uh, leave in about a week and a half. And so you what, you stopped by here for a quickie with a 15 year old before you went over to Iraq? Okay, so basically he was about a week and a half away from being deployed to Iraq. Okay, so what were we supposed to do with this information? I'm pretty sure the military invented the dishonorable discharge for exactly this sort of situation. And of course, Chris wasn't gonna let him get away with that excuse. He hit him with the hard truth suggesting that Ernest didn't just randomly decide to swing by for a quickie with someone who was clearly not in his age bracket. He meant to go ahead with his plans. It turns out the 33-year-old military man is married. His wife's picture is on the camera. But Ernest tried every last attempt to deflect the blame. And in the meantime, Chris was left rolling his eyes at the absurdity of the situation. But this is where things start to get even more twisted. Ernest started bragging about his family. I mean, come on, dude. At least spare them from the mess. But wait, you gotta see this. I have a kid, yes. You have a kid. How old is your kid? <sighs> She's seven. I mean, I can't believe it. In one last attempt to save face, Ernest whipped out photos of his wife and son like that was gonna be the difference between walking free and getting put behind bars. But of course, Chris wasn't letting him off the hook that easily. He hit Ernest with the hard questions. Why is a married military man with a kid sweating bullets in the home of someone way younger than him, camera in hand, and itching to head upstairs? But what was Ernest's response? You have to watch this. I don't know. It's you don't know. No matter how implausible the man's you. story is, he sticks to it. Oh boy, he was struggling to come up with a valid answer, and his body couldn't cope with the anxiety. Talk about being a total nervous wreck. No matter how hard he tried, Ernest stumbled over his words, trying to come up with some half-baked excuse just to get a free pass out from the house. But sadly, Ernest's body language was saying otherwise. From fidgety hands, to the profuse amount of sweating, to fumbling words and making absolutely no eye contact, this dude was going through all the stages of having a nervous breakdown. And the reason? His lies. By this time, Chris had seen and heard enough. 
he pulled out the big guns, mentioning Dateline's infamous reports on guys like Ernest, who had a thing for this sort of shady meetup. And what was Ernest's reply? People getting caught. <sighs> Have you watched those shows? No, sir. Because you're about to be on one. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story on adults who try to meet kids on <laughs> Oh, please, sir. At this point, he was trying to deny reality even as the evidence stared him right in the face. And I don't think I need to bring up the chat logs all over again. The dude was aware he was entering messed up territory, so playing dumb after getting caught wasn't the best idea. Either way, Chris was done with Ernest for the day. Or, for all we know, there was another moron lined up right behind waiting to make an entrance. And so, Chris decided to reveal his true identity and put an end to the sweat fest going on here. And what was the creep's reaction? Oh, please, sir. I was told as a friend to come over, that was it. Pathetic. You had enough time to think it through, and no amount of crying or pleading is going to change anything at this stage. But even faced with the cameras and the undeniable truth staring him in the face, Ernest still clung to his delusions insisting he was just a poor, innocent friend who got roped into this whole mess. And that's your story. That's my story. And you're sticking to it. Yes, sir. Now he'll get a chance to tell his story to the police. Wow, would he ever learn? I guess we'll never know, because this story is about to take an unexpected turn. So, after all the drama with Chris, Ernest finally decided he had said his piece. But once outside, the cops weren't willing to let him walk away scot-free. Police department, down on the ground! Down on the ground! Down on the ground! Let go of your camera, easy. And what did Ernest do? Well, he set down his precious camera and started sobbing like there was no tomorrow. But the cops weren't, oh no. They started grilling him with questions, probably hoping to get some semblance of truth out of him. However, Ernest stuck to his story like glue, because apparently, denial was his best friend no matter how ridiculous it was making him sound. But the fun doesn't stop there. Ernest's little rendezvous with the law landed him in front of a judge. And what was the verdict, you ask? Mr. Timmons, your charges are attempted sexual assault and attempted luring bail is set at 50,000. No. Things weren't looking good for Ernest. His bail was set at a whopping $50,000. Yikes. Yeah. His bad decisions were finally catching up with him, and he was paying the price big time, but nobody could foresee the tragic end he was headed towards. It was September 7, 2007, and Ernest found himself in a community medical center, but not under the best circumstances. He was under guard from the Ocean County Police, and things weren't looking too good for him. The reason? Liver failure. Yeah, as grim as it sounds, Ernest succumbed to a chronic, pre-existing condition while awaiting his trial. And what makes it even more upsetting is the fact that Ernest intentionally stopped taking his medication. Why, you ask? Well, apparently, he thought it was better to meet his end through liver failure than face a prison term. Talk about a tough decision. See, Ernest was a member of the military, which meant that he'd been in police custody for a grueling six months since his arrest. And all this time, he'd been awaiting dishonorable discharge. Can you imagine the weight of that hanging over your head? And to make matters worse, Ernest's family had to grapple with the aftermath of his death. But hey, at least they were able to receive some military benefits, right? As for Ernest's final resting place, he was buried at Mountain View Memorial Park in Lakewood, Washington. It's a peaceful spot a fitting place for someone who's been through so much turmoil in life. Hopefully, he finally found some solace in the end. You see, this creepo's death is still shrouded with a long list of theories. And the more I looked, the more I found. From those who claim he did it to himself, to those who claim it was an inside job, I'll be going over each of these theories and trust me, one is better than the other. However, you can't deny how sad it is that someone as pious and patriot as Ernest had to meet such a shameful end. But who's to blame? The 33-year-old, who apparently loved fishing, brought this upon himself when he decided to net the wrong fish. Going by his memorial, Ernest, who had attended the Gustine High School, had joined the United States Air Force in 1992. Apparently, 
Back in the day, Ernest was a passionate advocate for youth projects, including the likes of the Special Olympics. Which is exactly what makes this entire thing even weirder. The fact that he got caught in the sting is proof that his passion for young stuff took a turn for the worst. Well, he did put his mind to work, but just not in the right place. I mean, how can you forget the reason he came up with for saving his sorry arse? Your friend told you to come. Yes, sir. And who's your friend? <sighs> A guy named Kevin. Oh yeah, that right there was one of the greatest excuses of the show. I mean, that guy named Kevin became famous after the episode aired. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen this before, but this right here is proof that this bozo's reason for showing up at the house kinda resonated well with the entire TCAP community. I mean, it's crazy how he could so spontaneously just come up with some random name off of his head and blame the entire thing on him, like no mercy at all. Oh, by the way, I looked him up, and he even has a couple of subscribers. And I even found this. Yeah, so it looks like Ernest made quite the name for himself before he left. But wait. What if this really happened? What if someone named Kevin did set him up? What if Ernest had to pay the price for some other guy who only used him to get a few picks? Yeah, the conspiracy surrounding Ernest Timmons' death is much deeper than you'd ever imagine. And I'm coming to that in just a little bit. This seems to be a master plan which was sketched out by someone who definitely not cry at the drop of a hat, like Ernest did. Yeah, it's got conspiracy theory written all over it. Some folks speculate that this elusive Kevin might actually be Kevin Westerbeck, mainly because he had ties to the military in a civilian role, but exploiting military service as an excuse for shady moves? Not cool, man. It's not just disgraceful, it's an insult to those who serve honorably. But hey, it's all just speculation at this point, so take it with a grain of salt. And then there's Ernest's Find a Grave page. Now, you'd think a memorial page would be a place for people to pay their respects and share fond memories, right? Wrong. Apparently, the page had to disable postings because it was getting bombarded with vandalism. It's not hard to see why people might act that way, but come on, let's not stoop to his level. But just for a second there, let's believe what he's saying is true. Because for some funny reason, his interaction with the setup when he entered the house sort of felt disconnected. Now for someone who had an extensive chat before showing up at the house. And let me remind you, the chat seemed to be total perv style, considering how hooked he was to the setup. Ernest's reaction to seeing her for the first time simply doesn't add up. Was he really here on someone's command? Now that's some food for thought. Here's what I found when I looked into this whole scenario. This hypothesis right here is all about why you should believe Ernest. For one, why was the chat only three hours long? And pretty much all through its length, it was all about this horny dude who was obsessed with size and seeing some raunchy pictures. Next, why were there no photos exchanged online? Remember Mike Manzi? He loved to flaunt himself and show off the biceps he didn't even have. But this Jokater34 didn't share one single picture of his. And what's more, he was suspicious of even the setup being real. The next thing that concerns me is the number of times the name Kevin shows up. Like I said earlier, Jockater34 calls himself Kevin, and that's like almost towards the end of the chat. It's the same name that Ernest came up with when confronted by Chris. Okay, it's possible that he just made it up and continued to sell his story, but what if he was telling the truth? I mean, just look at him sweating the hell out of every water droplet left in his body. Was it because someone else had to be in place of him, and he just got framed? Or was it just a natural reaction to being caught in the act? Now, someone here believes that Ernest probably had a promotion or something on those lines at stake, and so he walked into the sting unknowingly and got caught in the act. And on top of that, there are also rumors that Ernest wasn't given his medication on purpose. Or even better, the whole liver failure thing was a scam. Either way, the TCAP community didn't take him at his word either. So, what do you think? Was he killed to cover up some high-profile dude who might have gotten exposed during the interrogation? Or did he feel threatened enough to take his own life before someone did something to his family? Or 
Did he just end things so that his wife and daughter could enjoy the benefits after his death? To understand this, let's get into the cause of his death. Now, remember the statement released by the cops that claimed Ernest passed away from liver failure? Apparently, they want us to believe that he quit taking his medications so he could die even before the hearing. Honestly, going by this post here, Ernest passed away just two days before his sentencing. Was it an act of God? Can you actually time your death by turning away from the medications to this extent? Now, here's the thing. For his family to avail all the benefits of his death, he was supposed to die a natural death. And this pretty much fit his requirement. But isn't this just another way of committing suicide? How is it natural? Or are the cops keeping some vital information away from the public? Like covering someone arse to keep the US military from facing an epic meltdown? Because take a look at this comment right here, where the viewer claims that it was the jailers who refused to give him the medications, and not the other way around. And how can he be so sure? Because he knew him. Or at least that's what he says here, but that's not the end of it though. I even found a few viewers who pitched in their explanation for the reason behind Ernest literally dripping in sweat. Apparently, it's a sign of fatty liver, and when the liver gets hot, so does the body. Now, I'm no medical expert, and this might be true, but I haven't found one piece of evidence which shows that Ernest was already suffering from a liver condition at the time. However, this veteran did try to clear the air out by saying that this liver issue might be a recent condition, and the military doesn't just kick you out, but instead, he'd be entitled to medical retirement with full pay. And just when you think it all makes sense, this viewer messed the whole thing up with his own theory where he claimed that Ernest actually owes himself to death. Wow, this just keeps getting twisted. But here comes the one that tugs at my heart. On his Memorial Day in 2019, Ernest's wife, Amy Timmons, posted a remembrance post on Facebook where she spoke about how her husband was a great man and died serving the country. Does this cement the whole military meltdown issue? Does she know something which has never been made public? I guess until Amy speaks up, we'll never know. As for Ernest, considering he was of a certain rank in the US Air Force, he was laid to rest and got the whole nine yards. From the flag-draped coffin to a military headstone, Ernest was laid to rest as Sergeant Ernest Clayton Timmons, and not Jokater 34. Now that I have gone over all the possibilities that surround his mysterious death, what do you think happened? Was Ernest innocent? Or did he live a double life? Was Ernest knocked out? Or did he off himself? What do you think? Don't forget to let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on the post notifications. Impressed by Chris Hansen's tactics? Wait until you see his most ingenious trap yet. Witness the master at work by clicking on the video.